So yesterday we finished with discussing the um, uh, the tools, the necessary tools to calculate thermodynamic properties of a particular theory. That could be uh, uh, the quantum theory, quantum mechanics, for example, or it could be a quantum field theory, and for example, QCD. And uh, uh, the uh, tool we discussed was the calculation of the partition function. Uh, and the convenient way to calculate partition function was to present it in the form of the path integral, as you had seen in various incarnations already several times in this, uh, in this, in this school. So uh, uh, this, is, um, this is something which allows you to compute. So let me restore the infrared cutoff first. Uh, I think it's somewhere here, right? But, uh, yeah. Um, so once you once you know how to calculate z, and of course in very simple examples where you know the spectrum of the theory exactly, and computing z is 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 really a rather simple exercise, uh, such as for example harmonic oscillator or rotator, and you can do it. But in uh, interacting quantum systems, in particular interacting quantum field theories, you have to resort to different means to calculate. Uh, Z and therefore to know free energy and all thermodynamics quantities that you want to know in the theory. So um, <coughs> uh, we already discussed. So one possible tool is to so this so you represent Z as a as a path integral, and then you can compute, for example, using perturbation theory if you have a small parameter in 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 the, in the problem. perturbation theory, or you can use non-perturbative tools such as uh, lattice, as was discussed in the, in the first lecture today. Uh, so e.g. Uh, lattice, lattice quantum field theory, or lattice QCD in particular. And this will give you some information about Z and therefore about uh, free energy. So uh, we finished yesterday by discussing uh, the uh, collision of heavy ions, and the collision of heavy ions produces the state of nuclear matter at a particular energy density. The particular energy density was estimated to be uh, roughly fi about 5 GeV per Fermi cube. And the theoretical question is, what do we know about QCD? In the, in the realm under, under these conditions when, when energy density is that, that high. Right? So do we know something? And the answer to this question is yes, we do know something. So let me, um, <coughs> let me just sketch uh, one plot where things will be, I hope, sufficiently transparent. No, ah, here is another tool. Very important. Um, so, <coughs> what you can compute? So, we, we wrote we wrote these formulas yesterday, and, and Guy wrote them today. Uh, formulas for pressure or the energy density computed perturbatively as a function of temperature. So, the first term would be a contribution from from the ideal gas, right? and you can do it either by computing the one loop contribution as Guy did today. Or, in fact, you can, you can just compute it from the usual statistical mechanics formulas, as we did yesterday, by substituting the uh, dispersion relation of relativistic one single relativistic massive particle. They, th these two computations will give you the same uh, answer, which is proportional to d to the fourth. And then there is a correction. And you can compute many, many corrections until your perturbation theory fails, as Guy explained today. Now, <coughs> in uh, QCD, you can also use lattice results, and uh, combined with this perturbation theory, they will produce something like this for pressure and similar plot for energy density. So I will plot pressure normalized by this ideal gas Stefan Boltzmann uh, result. Right. So at very very high temperature, and this is versus uh, temperature divided by some reference temperature, which I will call T critical. I will explain in a second what this means. So if temperature is super high, 
then we will have ideal gas of quarks and gluons. And normalized here, normalized plot by Stefan Boltzmann, it means that this plot will go to 1. Okay, so somewhere far, far to the right, you will have 1. This is ideal gas. And then we know, we saw last time, that the first correction has a uh, minus sign, so it will go down. It will go down. And then the question is, what will happen in the middle? So <coughs> what will happen in the middle is a curve of this type. So it will... It will have a certain relatively sharp rise somewhere in the middle, and this somewhere in the middle will denote by by uh, t critical, and then it will go to the ideal gas result. So <coughs> this um, uh, so, so uh, again, so I, I I stress that we know that here because of asymptotic freedom, we know that alpha s goes to zero uh, at super high temperatures or super uh, large energies, right? So this is asymptotic freedom in QCD, and therefore we know what happens here. Now, the rest is a combination of these two approaches. One of them is perturbation theory approach, which is not entirely useless. It gives you some behavior, so some, some, uh, some behavior of this, of this uh, plot in the region where alpha s is sufficiently small. You do have to do all this sort of resummations that Guy mentioned today, and this is a rather sophisticated business, because if you naively do the perturbation theory, then uh, the, the uh, successive approximations to your ideal gas results uh, will not converge to anything. And they will go, so the first approximation will give you something going up, a second going down, and going up and down. So, so it won't be a smooth convergent to a certain uh, result as, as the Taylor series would give you, right? as you already anticipate from the uh, kind of corrections that you're getting there. So, uh, but nonetheless, with resummations and so on, this can be tamed <coughs> sufficiently. And, of course, you have results on the lattice. Now, the lattice cannot uh, extend very far into the asymptotic freedom region here, right? So that, that, is, that is very difficult, but lattice can tell you more or less reliably what is ha happening here. And then you can combine the two approaches, and I won't go into details of how precisely this is done, and this curve, this sketch here, is the result of combination of the lattice results and perturbative results. Okay, so <coughs> so this is this is what we know about that in QCD. In QCD. Now, what you observe here is this transition, which is not a phase transition. A phase transition would would mean that something, uh, something like free energy oppression and so on would have, for example, a discontinuity of a certain order. So here we have a smooth transition, which is called a crossover. So this is crossover. But nonetheless, the crossover is characterized by a rather sharp rise in the number of degrees of freedom in the system, right? So here uh, I remind you, so that pressure, entropy, and energy density, all of them will scale as t to, uh, as t to some appropriate powers. For example, temperature will, uh, entropy will scale as t cube, entropy, um, uh, the uh, uh, pressure and energy density as t to the fourth. But in front of them will be a factor which basically counts the number of degrees of freedom, and you can see. <coughs> You can see a rather sharp rise in the in number of degrees of freedom happening here. So this is a transition, crossover transition. <coughs> and the region here will be called the quark gluon plasma, QGP, where <coughs> you can think of ideal gas of quarks and gluons plus corrections. And here you have hadrons. In some uh, some loose sense, can be called the bound states of quarks and gluons, right? So, so uh, I will come to this <coughs> point later on. But the idea is that there is a melting temperature, which is not sharply defined, but it's uh, it's <coughs> nonetheless uh, a certain parameter, which can be determined from the latest calculations. And this T critical is approximately 170 MeV, or um, uh, in uh, terms of uh, energy density critical, this is about 1 GeV. All right, so this is, the, this is the crossover that occurs. So this is what we know if somebody gives us a Lagrangian of QCD and asks what happens at energy density such and such, then we can produce this plot and, um, and, and, give, and give the answer. All right? Fine. So what else can we say? Well, we can say a little bit more. Um, uh, as we discussed last time, 
uh, a very convenient way of kind of looking at your system with many body constituents is to draw a phase diagram phase diagram and <coughs> in this school later on you will have very detailed discussion of KCD phase diagram by uh, Misha Stefanov I believe so it's uh, I won't attempt to <coughs> uh, say more than necessary about the phase diagram but nonetheless I want to uh, mention this so uh, phase diagram in variables temperature and the baryonic chemical potential for QCD yes one thing I didn't mention here is that uh, uh, we, we have in this curve the crossover curve for QCD specifically of course the theoretical models of gauge theories you can you can change your parameters you can for example you can remove some quarks you can consider two quarks instead of six right and and you can change the gauge group and in other words you can you can plot this curve for different gauge theories in question right so a variety of gauge theories you can you can you can uh, uh, play with uh, group uh, s u n where n goes one two three uh, two three four five and six and so on right and see how it ch changes with n for example so uh <coughs> Sometimes, for some values of these external parameters, or uh, parameters relevant for, for a particular model, gauge theory model, this will be actual phase transition. It will not be a crossover. All right? So when you, when you see in, some in the literature, for example, a plot which tells you there is a phase transition, then uh, check what kind of Lagrangian you are dealing with. Right? So in QCD, it's a crossover, but it, it need, need not be uh, a crossover in, in the generic uh, gauge theory. All right. So <coughs> the phase diagram looks like this. Now uh, there is a transition which I just mentioned at 170 MeV, and uh, there is a certain line. So this is our crossover line. It's not a phase transition line. And then there is a conjecture that, in fact, there is a phase transition line which ends with a critical point, sounds like this. Now there is also a line of transition between the vacuum state and the nuclei state. And this happens around 310 MeV. And then there are various conjectures which I won't discuss in any detail. So there is something like quark liquid and CFL, which stands for mm, color of flavor locked uh, phase. Um, but um, and, and here we have we have neutron stars, neutron stars, and so on. So let me put a big question mark here, just to indicate that these are theoretical models, so these are conjectures and so on. And what we really know, we don't even know about about this line, right? So I put a question mark here. And as I mentioned yesterday, so these new accelerators, such as uh, Fair and Nika, will be looking for PCD. <laughs> around vicinity of this conjectured point in hope to actually detect it. Right? So RIC and uh, LHC, the heavy ion collisions, are um, uh, accelerators which explore the region of very high temperature and relatively modest chemical potential. So, the, so the, um, our discussion will be relevant for this region. So here we have this quark-gluon plasma, and <coughs> here we have hadrons. And there is a crossover, right? So which is which is okay. So again, so so most of this of this knowledge, which is very limited, as you can see, uh, also comes from these two from these two uh, sources, right? So basically, compute Z in one way or the other. See. All right, but um, evolution of quark gluon plasma. Uh, requires not only knowledge of thermodynamics, um, so of thermodynamics and also knowledge of transport. As I discussed uh, yesterday, uh, the evolution of this quark gluon plasma fireball, whose time scale, so so time scale delta t, is from one to ten 
times 10 to the minus 24 second. And the evolution of this fireball is described, the nuclear uh, metro, QCD under these conditions, uh, is described by relativistic Navier-Stokes equations. And relativistic Navier-Stokes equations will need as an input, as we will discuss in, in, in several uh, minutes, uh, they will need as an input values of transport coefficients computed from first principles in QCD. Okay? So the moral of the story is the same as in the first lecture. We need, if we want to describe a system of many particles, many constituents, then typically we would need tools to compute thermodynamic properties, such as partition function and free energy, but we also need some tools to compute transport properties of the system. Okay? All right. And uh, <coughs> now um, let me um, again mention, so uh, maybe summarize again, perhaps maybe uh, too persistently. Um, so what kind of tools we have, right? So we have um, lattice QCD, and uh, you can say that, well, uh, if you need transport or if you need to compute any other properties, why don't you use lattice, right? So you want viscosity, you want uh, conductivity, you want some uh, properties which, which have uh, non-zero uh, non time enter in your equations. You can, in principle, uh, compute it from the lattice. You cannot compute it directly uh, because the lattice for, for, for convergence and so on, you need computation in Euclidean uh, space, right? You need a good measure, e to the minus s e. Right, to, to, for convergence. But naively you can say, but nothing prevents me from computing this in Euclid and then doing analytic continuation. And by analytic continuation, I can go back to Minkowski and then I can do whatever I, whatever I want. Right? So I can compute things in Euclid and then, then analytically continue. And in principle, it, it is possible. So it's, there is no saying that this is prohibited or anything, except that uh, there are difficulties. So you can, you can say this uh, LQCD plus analytic continuation. But there are difficulties. And difficulties are typically associated with the fact that lattice, which you use for your computation, has finite size. In order to do analytic continuation, you need to know uh, the properties of uh, the stuff you are computing. Um, far away in, for example, a complex plane of, um, uh, of uh, uh, frequency. And you, know, you, you need to know asymptotic behavior of the system. In asymptotic behavior you cannot get from a finite size lattice. So this is, this is very difficult. It's a subtle issue which I, 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 I won't again discuss in details unless you, unless you, you want to know about this uh, privately. And in fact, here in Mainz there are people who know this very well. But <coughs> Uh, uh, but uh, so, so what I'm saying is that this is not the avenue which is completely closed, but this is something which at the moment is very, very difficult to do to get to get reliable results. So, so, um, so let me leave it at that. And then, yeah. So then there is perturbation theory. Perturbation theory. Uh, so, so this is difficult again, as Guy described difficult. For example, there are infrared divergences and so on. So this is, this is difficult to do. Uh, and then uh, there is also another tool which I must mention before we go to holography and related things. And this tool is called kinetic theory. Now let me, let me spend maybe a short time on reminding you how this tool works for reasons which I maybe explain later. So what you do in kinetic theory schematically. Well, uh, first of all, of course, you can have either classical or quantum system, right? So classical and 
uh, quantum systems. And uh, this uh, will have various uh, differences, which again are not that fundamentally important. But I will focus on, uh, on talking about classical uh, kinetic theory, which goes back to Maxwell and Boltzmann, 19th century. Right? So you have basically classical gas. You have Hamiltonian, which describes uh, a classical system with interaction potential. And you want to, you want to <coughs> basically say um, what you can uh, about, uh, for example, not only thermodynamics, but also transport. So in principle, you want to solve a problem completely. So <coughs> one of the tools in, uh, in, uh, in uh, classical kinetic theory is um, um, the so-called Bogolubov, Born, Green, Kirkwood, Ivon um, um, chain and uh, uh, equations which follow from it. So, so for example, Boltzmann equation and to some extent Vlasov equation they can be derived from this BBGKY hierarchy or, or a chain, sometimes called a chain. So uh, <coughs> let me just remind you how uh, this whole thing is uh, derived. So you represent your system, in this case a classical system, in a phase space. Right, suppose you have n particles, which means that you have n momenta, n coordinates, maybe a Avogadro number, maybe two, maybe one. Right? And uh, <coughs> this system can be characterized by a point in uh, a phase space. And here, P and Q, they are multidimensional. So they go to, uh, from, from 1 to, uh, to n, each of them. Now, <coughs> the evolution of the system in this phase space <coughs> will correspond to evolution of this one point. right? So the system goes from one configuration to another configuration. And th this point will have some complicated motion as a function of time in this phase space. Now, any system is given by some initial conditions. And therefore, it's rather pointless from a mathematical point of view to talk about a point in, in, uh, in, uh, in the phase space, right? because you can never, you can never uh, specify initial conditions down to, uh, to, to a point. Right? You specify a certain region of initial conditions, right? and with some probability of the uh, system to be in this region. The probability of the system to be in this region will be characterized by uh, the probability distribution Wn, which will depend on p, q, and time. Right, so <coughs> your, phase your system will be characterized by, uh, by this, uh, by this uh, object. And <coughs> this object, so this is probability distribution, probability distribution in phase space. And this object will evolve. Right, so if you start with some initial state and then let it run, so each point in this, uh, in this little blob will evolve as a function of time. And therefore, the blob itself, as a function of time, will evolve in, into something. If your system is an integrable system, this blob will stay as it, as it was. Right? So nothing will happen to it. It just evolves as one point, because you know, there is no, you know, these trajectories will be, will be completely uh, similar to each other. There is no deviation from, uh, from, from uh, nearby boundary conditions and so on. But in realistic systems, because you have various interesting properties like uh, stochasticity and so on, this blob actually evolves in a rather complicated way. And with time, it will occupy uh, a phase, a part of a phase space, which may be rather non-trivial. And of course, if your system is such that it's supposed to be described in the end of the evolution by, uh, by uh, the equilibrium density matrix or equilibrium ensemble, your hope is that somehow this uh, little amoeba, this, uh, this uh, phase space region, will eventually, with time going by, will somehow will spread all over the phase space and occupy it in, 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 uh, completely with, with certain density, which is given by rho, the, the partition function of your, uh, sorry, the density matrix of your, of your system, the probability of occupying the whole, whole phase space. Right? Now, <coughs> this is a complicated dynamical problem. The equation which uh, W satisfies is, um, fairly simple, and it's uh, basically a consequence of 
<coughs> uh, Hamilton's equations. So this is Poisson bracket. We are talking about classical system. Um, now, there is a wonderful uh, statement uh, due to Liouville. Eighteen thirty-eight, uh, which says that this probability density, the total derivative of probability density, is equal to zero, so it is conserved in time. Right? It behaves as incompressible liquid. The proof of this theorem is is uh, is fairly uh, straightforward. I won't go over it, but you can find it in various textbooks. It's so the equation above is actually. <coughs> it's this because this is a full derivative. The full derivative, uh, 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 full derivative is equal to partial derivative plus uh, and, and the Poisson bracket. So, <coughs> fine. So, what the kinetic theory does? So, this is all great. I mean, nobody can solve this equation for a rather number of particles, obviously. Um, uh, so, what the kinetic theory does is the following. So, it reduces a number of um, uh, distribution functions. So, let us introduce functions f1 which is a function which depends on, temp uh, on uh, time, one momentum and one coordinate. And this is up to a volume of the system. This is just normalization. The integral over the whole probability distribution, right, which depends on this, I remind you, this depends on p1 and so on, pn, uh, and then q1 and so on, qn, and then time. And you integrate this w, suppose you know it, you integrate it over dp2 and so on, dpn, and then dq2 and so on, dqn. All right, so integrate over all momenta, all coordinates except p1 and p2, uh, p1 and q1. Okay, so the result depends on p1 and q1. So you can easily guess what will happen with f2, right? f2, which is a function of t, p1, q1, P2 and Q2 is up to a normalization, which is just a convenience, matter of convenience, is Wn integrated over dp3 and so on, dpn, and then dq3 and so on, dqn, right? And you can happily continue this until at some point you run out of integration variables, okay? So you have a hierarchy of these distribution functions. And moreover, these distribution functions obey a system of equations, which, are easily, which can be easily derived from the, uh, from the Liouville equation. And uh, I, again, I, I emphasize that Liouville equation is, is not a magical equation. It follows from, uh, from dynamics, from Hamilton dynamics of the, of the system. So this is classical mechanics, rewritten in a different way, rewritten for for phase space, nothing else, right? So these are, these are just Newtonian, if you want, Newtonian equation of, of motion, right? Now I want to rewrite this Newtonian equation of motion of our system in terms of Fs. <coughs> How can I do this? Well, I have my basic equation, which is uh, Liouville's equation, and I have definitions of Fs. So what I can do, I can, um, yeah, so let's specify, before doing this, let's specify uh, the Hamiltonian, so for, we are talking about classical system, right, so for the Hamiltonian, which is a sum uh, over i p squared over 2m, and then perhaps there is some external um, potential, external field acting on this uh, system, electric field or something like this, and then there is <coughs> interaction term, which we will denote by phi, so phi, let me write this as dependent on qi minus qj, right? So this is a, an example of interacting classical system. So then <coughs> an exercise for you, a uh, relatively straightforward exercise, please show that the equation for f1 is the following. Over m d f1 over d qi minus d u external over d q i. Here, summation over i is assumed. f1 over d p i. And here is the right-hand side, n divided by the free volume. And here comes the interesting 
part. So this is the inter interaction potential differentiated with respect to coordinate qi and df2 over d ei. Now uh, this uh, potential depends on q minus q prime, all right? And here f2 is a function of t q q prime p and p prime as it should be. And the whole thing is integrated over d q prime d p prime, all right? So <coughs> to, to, get, to get this equation, you all you need is written on this board, right? So it is definition of f2 and then, and then the Liouville equation or, or Hamilton's equation. Fine. So <coughs> you can proceed, right? So you took, you took equation for uh, f1, but you can do the same for f2, f3, and so on. And for uh, fs, let me write at least once, right? So equation for fs has a following form, dfs over dt plus sum over k from 1 to s. It has a similar form as you can see, slightly more indices, but no more than that. So there is a derivative of fs with respect to uh, uh, coordinates. Then if you have external potential, then you have this term qi k dfs over d pi k and the important again the important part comes um, on the right hand side one over little v so let me introduce little v is our uh, free volume divided by n so this is just a definition <coughs> uh, sum over k sum over k from 1 to s here we have the integral d phi the interaction potential which depends on q i of k uh, particle minus q i of particle s plus one like this over d q i k d f s plus one divided by d p i k integrated over d q s plus one until the end uh, sorry, uh, uh, d, d q s plus 1, d p s plus 1. All right. So for, for uh, if you have um, a distribution function uh, f s, then it obeys uh, the equation, the integral differential equation, because there is a differential part of this. I think the, the bracket close. Uh, differential part of it, but then there is also integral involved. So this is integral differential equation. And what is more important is that the equation for fs generically is coupled to, uh, uh, to, to fs plus 1. So the equation is not closed. So this, by the way, this is, I mean, what is written here is bbgky. Okay. And uh, this was derived in, by, by all these people independently in various years in particular by Bogolubov in 1946. So, uh, of course, it's, it's fairly, so at the moment, this is completely equivalent to classical dynamics of these <coughs> n particles, right? There is nothing, there is no approximations, nothing at all, right? So, so you, you kind of rewrite your Hamiltonian dynamics or Newtonian equations, if you want, in this fairly complicated form. Uh, as such, it's fairly useless, right? Because we have, of course, some other number of these equations, and moreover, all of them are coupled with each other, right? So, what do you hope to extract from this? I mean, not nothing, nothing much more than from the original uh, Avogadro number Newtonian uh, equations of motion. But then <coughs> you can you can you can stare at this equation and and uh, try various uh, approaches to actually decouple it and get a closed form equation for one of these functions, so for example for f1 or f2 or f3 and so on. So that so the, the, the idea is that somehow on the right hand side of this equation you have to express for example f2 through f1. If you have some additional knowledge which allows you to do this, then you have a closed form equation for only one function f1. And then, no matter how complicated the equation is, you can solve it, for example, with help of computers, or so, but you have a closed form equation, right? So this is, <coughs> this is a form. This is a problem. And uh, um, <coughs> this is what kinetic theory does. 
um, it provides you with um, uh, various methods of decoupling the Bogolubov chain. So we are looking for closed form equation for F1. Right, and uh, there are different um, uh, there are different way ways to uh, <coughs> to um, to do it, but um, let me first analyze. So how can we decouple it? Right. So by 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 looking at various uh, small po po potential small parameters which can appear, which do appear in in this uh, Bogolubov chain of equations. So let me introduce let me introduce some quantities. So if phi naught is the strength of the potential phi of, of potential inter uh, interaction potential and um, uh, R naught is the effective radius of interaction effective radius of interaction Right, then um, I will introduce also tau, which is the time scale of the kinetic equations. Right, you notice here right, that, that so uh, your f's, right, so forget about normalization and so on, but, but <coughs> um, the appropriate time scale in the equation, uh, so, sorry, the, the appropriate scale in the equation is time, right? So you have d over dt. And f is the same on both sides. So you have d over dt. It means that this appropriate scale in the kinetic equation will be some time scale tau. We don't know what it is. It could be mean free time, for example, in, in a dilute gas. But, um, but uh, because you have explicitly time entering here in the denominator, the, the appropriate uh, time scale in whatever you are trying to solve here will be, uh, uh, will be a time scale tau, some, some, some scale. And then um, let me also introduce the, uh, the following thing. So if you think of uh, gas which is sufficiently dilute, then um, uh, there will be mean free path involved, and there will be some temperature. Right, so I will uh, introduce the temperature scale by the following equation, and where u naught is L over tau, All right? So, so this, so this defines defines uh, uh, temperature. So, I, I kind of anticipate that that whatever happens here, we have a limit, presumably, right? We have to prove it, but presumably we have a limit in which we have non-interacting, uh, essentially non-interacting, very weakly interacting dilute gas. And for dilute gas, we have a notion of equilibrium, and this equilibrium has some temperature and equipartition of energy and so on. So you can, you can think of these quantities as, a, as, a, as a limit quantities. So this is just, a, uh, just some parameters that allow us to analyze appropriate limits of this chain. So what happens? Uh, you can decouple the BBGKY chain in various cases. And let me just list these cases. Now, so decoupling of BBGKY. Uh, so it happens in 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 uh, in the following situation. So this this will require a little bit of kind of staring at this at this uh, at this equation and using these parameters. But you can you can hopefully do it. It's not that difficult. So <coughs> then you have R naught cube divided by little v. Remind you that little v is is the normalized volume. So free volume divided by n. So if this is much less than one, then you can decouple uh, the <coughs> the BBGKY chain. And this corresponds to a dilute system. Dilute system, very dilute gas, for example. And you can decouple. You can also decouple then the strength of your potential is much less than this kT. And this corresponds, so for example, with, with R naught cube of the order of V. 
And this corresponds to weakly coupled system. Weakly coupled system, not necessarily dilute. Right, so this condition is not valid, but, but if, if system is sufficiently weakly coupled, you can still do a decoupling, and then you get a, <coughs> a kinetic equation. Then <coughs> there is um, another condition uh, where when you can decouple, and this condition is still condition of weak coupling, but now the uh, R0 cube over uh, V of the order of KT over phi naught, and this is much greater than 1. So there is this regime which is known by the regime of Debye and Huckel. Pretty important for practical applications. And then finally, there is regime number 4, uh, where you have phi naught much less than kt, and r naught cube much less than v. So this means weak interactions Interaction, interactions and dilute system, which is not very interesting because this means essentially ideal gas, maybe with little corrections, right? So there are these <coughs> four cases. Now, in all these cases, in all these cases, <coughs> you can uh, uh, you can estimate the um, time scale. Uh, which uh, sets, the, sets the scale of the kinetic equation in question. And uh, you can show that in all cases, you will have the following interesting inequality. <coughs> so <coughs> um, this means, so just to give you an example, so this, is, this requires some analysis. I, I, I won't go into that, so you can, you can look at uh, the kinetic theory references in my in my list, but um, uh, this inequality, uh, uh, for example, appears in, uh, in one of the fundamental books on kinetic theory by uh, Gurov, and the, so this is in 1966, but this is also Bogolubov and Gurov, 1947. It's rather curious, because we will see in holography that the systems which will treat uh, with the help of gauge string duality, uh, they, of course, don't satisfy this inequality. They have tau of the order of h bar over kt. Right, so this means automatically that no kinetic theory can actually penetrate this regime. That's one of the reasons why I draw this attention, so much attention to. So in normal systems like air, these conditions, uh, this condition is happily satisfied. So, for example, um, so for air <coughs> at normal at room temperature, uh, uh, so we have say, 300 Kelvin. So we have H bar over KT, approximately 10 to minus 13 seconds, and tau of order 10 to 10 minus 10 seconds. So uh, this means, you have estimates, this means that you have a chance to describe the air in this room with the help of kinetic theory. And you do, right? So if you want, if you want to compute uh, transport coefficients for uh, gases, uh, oxygen, and so on, then you can do uh, it via kinetic theory. Yeah. And so, but, but how do you, do you now get H bar from a pure classical? Uh, uh, you don't. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> as I said, so I won't. Um, I mean, um, uh, in order to in order to get this inequality, you have to uh, think of a quantum version of the uh, phase space and so on. So it's uh, it's not it's, it doesn't follow from what is written on on, on the board, right? But uh, but this is something which. Uh, which kinetic theory can provide you with. Okay, so uh, uh, the, the last remark about kinetic theory is that um, um, uh, there are several ways of decoupling, right? So we talked about the decoupling, and um, um, one avenue of decoupling 
the Bogolubov chain is to assume a certain ansatz for F2. There are different types uh, of, of these uh, conjectures. So one of them is <coughs> the following. So you assume that your F2, which is a function of P1, P2, Q1, and Q2, uh, as you go to sufficiently large distances in position space, actually is a product of two functions f1, each depending on different different coordinates, right? So um, then, so so this is uh, this is the condition. So this is uh, this is Bogolubov. But you also have different ansatz uh, from Kirkwood and from other people. So this is quite uh, interesting. I so uh, when you when you when you make ansatz of this type, then your goal is to derive the uh, kinetic equation, the closed form kinetic equation for F1, and you can do it fairly straightforwardly. And you end up with equations such as Boltzmann equation. Okay. And once you have Boltzmann equation, you can ask various questions of whether you can derive, for example, equations of hydrodynamics from, uh, from Boltzmann equation, whether you can compute transport coefficients and so on. What are the methods of doing so? And uh, the answer is yes, you can. And, and there, is, there are methods developed. Uh, in the beginning of 20th century, very sophisticated ones of how to how to how to do all of this. Right? So kinetic theory is a fantastic, and I stress it may not be obvious from what I what I was showing you. It's mathematically very rigorous discipline. So uh, things of this type and various um, uh, conditions of uh, weakening of correlations. And uh, uh, analysis of integral differential equations is done at very high mathematical rigor. So this is a, is a fantastic theory. Uh, as we saw, it doesn't apply to any systems, right? So I cannot take my Bogolubov chain and do some decoupling, and uh, with the help of this, describe, uh, for example, the shear viscosity of water, right? Because in the attempt to do so, I will violate one of these conditions. In particular, I will violate this one. Okay. So the moral of the story is twofold. Moral number one is that when you deal with Boltzmann equation or various approximations of Boltzmann equation, the most popular for some reason is the so-called relaxation time approximation, RTA. Right? So Boltzmann equation is not given <coughs> from heaven, right? It's, it's a consequence of mechanical or quantum mechanical equations of motion via rewriting these equations in the form of BBGKY chain and making certain approximation, decoupling this system of equations. Once you decouple, you lose various properties. In particular, you lose reversibility of equations, and then you have this H theorem and all these wonderful things, right? So uh, please keep in mind that this is, this is an approximation, and the approximation happens here at this level. Uh, but it's incredibly useful, of course. Fine. So now um, let's talk about another tool, right? So uh, remember our plan, right? So the plan was to discuss tools to compute thermodynamics. So we compute, we, we discuss how to compute things uh, with a partition function. So you can compute it perturbatively, you can compute it on a lattice, for example. Now there is another tool, which is kinetic theory from which you can compute in principle. You can compute whatever you want. You can compute Z if you want, but you also can compute transport, but only in a limited number of, uh, under a limited number of conditions, which were listed here, plus condition, which is written here on board. All right? So this is one of the tools. There is another tool, which I'm going to use extensively in holographic calculations. And this tool goes by the name of linear response theory. So let me say a few words about linear response, unless there are questions about this part. It's a good time to very tired. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> 
So another tool linear response. Now, <coughs> uh, first, let me start with something very light. And very light is equation harmonic oscillator. It already appeared on board today. And in general, this is a lovely uh, equation to deal with. So suppose you have a harmonic oscillator with friction. And we are talking about classical harmonic oscillator, right? So it's even simpler. And there is some external force which is applied to uh, my system called f. And let's suppose that our parameter gamma is greater than 0. Great. We can immediately write down solution for x. So x as a function of t is given by the free solution. So we need to specify, of course, the initial conditions to this equation. But in general, it's a free solution x naught of t plus the integral from minus infinity to infinity, the appropriate Green's function of this equation, t minus t prime, and then f of t prime uh, dt prime. Right? So it's a linear operator. So thankfully, thanks to Green, right, so we know how to solve other people, very smart people. So where Green's function, of course, obeys the, uh, uh, the same equation, so this is linear operator. L acting on x. <coughs> Linear operator acting on Green's function equal, uh, gives us delta function. Right, so then I can immediately write a solution for x. Now, if I use Fourier representation, I can write down the same equation in the following form. Well, first of all, I can, I can, I can explicitly compute g. And then I can write down the uh, solution in Fourier space. And this is actually more or less what we need, right? So model of some technical complications. So yeah, uh, so here, of course, so g will depend on t minus t prime because the operator itself is, is translationally invariant in time, right? The coefficients do not depend on time. So I, I know that there is a time translation invariance in the operator itself. So if I introduce the Fourier images, 1 over 2 pi e to the minus i omega t, x of omega d omega. And I remind you that delta can also be represented as a Fourier integral <coughs> e to the minus i omega t minus t prime d omega. So with these representations, I can immediately find that g of omega is this interesting expression with minus sign omega minus omega minus omega minus so plus omega minus omega minus, where omega plus minus are the roots, which already appeared in Laura's lecture just several hours ago. Uh, minus gamma squared minus i gamma. OK, so so far everything is trivial. Right, so we have explicit green function. And we can write down the solution for x of t explicitly if you want to. The solution in Fourier space will look like this. So x as a function of omega is x naught our free solution, which takes care of uh, the appropriate conditions, and then and then this or or delta so change of x is directly proportional by the Green's function involved to the Fourier image of the perturbation. Okay. So, so this is all hopefully very straightforward. But let's pause for a second and yeah. So, so the uh, what we found is not 
very surprising, right? So we have a we have a system which is a free system. So here it's a just a just a harmonic, so it's a free system, right? And we act with some external force, which maybe started acting at time going to minus infinity, and we want to see now at time t what happened to x. So what happened to x is given by this expression, or equivalently by this expression. So the response of the system to the external influence is proportional to this magnitude of this to, to the Im Fourier image of this influence. A coefficient of proportionality is this interesting object, which is Green's function. So let's just look for a second at how this function actually behaves. So it's written explicitly here, and the roots are also written. So it has two poles, right? So in the complex plane, so of course there is i here, right? There is i, and gamma is positive. It means that my two roots, my two poles, will lie in the lower half plane. So if this is imaginary part of omega, and this is real part of omega, then my two roots, uh, generically, will be located uh, in the lower half plane of frequency. And a curious property, which let me just mention it, especially for people who do have experience in holographic calculations. Uh, the curious property is that you can also think of what happens to these two poles if I change gamma, my dumping, right, in, in my equation. And you can explore it, of course, uh, 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 you know, sitting at home, right, and happily. But it's quite obvious, right, that if gamma changes, uh, then um, these two poles will move in a complex plane. And they will move in a curious fashion. So they will move along a circle like this. And then at some value of gamma, they collide. Of course, this is a quadratic equation, so they cannot just disappear. And uh, uh, <coughs> one of the poles will move up, and another pole will move down like this, if you change gamma. So you, you have an you have oscillating regime, and then you have a dumped regime, and overdumped, and so on. So all of this in the complex plane of G, uh, for G of omega. Is, <coughs> is quite visible. Fine. So uh, then I can write down my delta x in position space. So let me write this down here. Uh, so delta x of t, I can Fourier transform. And I have uh, the integral. So this, this uh, equation here tells us the integral from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, g of t minus t prime. Right times uh, this uh, uh, f uh, of t prime d t prime, but then there is an interesting property of this g uh, uh, as a function of t. Then you uh, you can you can find explicitly uh, uh, what this uh, what this g is. Let me write this down here. So g of t minus t prime. In order to calculate it, you so you have expression in in, uh, in uh, uh, Fourier space, in, in, in frequency space, all you have to do is to take the integral, to take the integral over omega, right, over real line. Right? So you have to take this integral. And of course, you take this integral by using Cauchy theorem. And by using Cauchy theorem, you see, well, well, this function has two singularities, two poles. And both poles are sitting in the lower half plane. Right? So <coughs> when, you do the, uh, when you do the Fourier, as usual in, in such situations, you have to look for the sign of t minus t prime, right? If t minus t prime is positive, right? Then, uh, 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 so omega, which has now both positive, both, both real part and imaginary part, right? So the imaginary part of uh, 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 omega, so if you want to close your contour, for example, in the upper half plane, and therefore imaginary part will be positive, uh, then uh, uh, it will be a disaster because uh, because you uh, you have an exponent which will blow up, right? So in other words, uh, the way you close the contour is correlated with the sign of t minus t prime. And if you have if the sign of t minus t prime forces you to close the contour in the upper half plane, by Cauchy theorem you will get zero because there are no poles, there are no singularities sitting in the upper half plane. Whereas if the sign of t minus t prime forces you to close the contour on the lower half plane, you pick up something non-trivial because there are two poles here. Okay. So the moral of the story 
is that because g of omega is analytic in the upper half plane, <coughs> you have g of t minus t prime identically 0 for t minus t prime less than 0. And therefore, the expression for t minus t prime, which sometimes is called retarded Green's function, for reasons which are pretty obvious, but I will repeat them in a second, is given by some expression involving sine of what there is a square root omega naught squared minus gamma squared. And here we have t minus t prime. So these details are not so terribly important, but nonetheless, let me write them down. Uh, minus gamma squared. The important thing here is the theta function, heavy side theta function, which is sitting in front. And this is exactly, this is exactly the reflection of the situation which I just described. Right? So this Green's function is equal to 0 for, 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 ta for, for t prime, which is, uh, uh, which is greater than t. And <coughs> the physical meaning of this is obvious from this formula. Of course, you act, so suppose you have a system, you start acting on it by force f at some time long ago, time going to minus infinity, and you want to find the answer now at time t. So obviously, the answer at time t will depend on what f was doing from t to minus infinity. But it cannot depend on what f will be doing from t to plus infinity. Right? So this half of this uh, interval, of infinite interval, uh, for this uh, half of the infinite inter in interval, uh, g better be zero, right? Because otherwise, you have violation of causality, right? So you can only the past influence the future, not, not the opposite, right? So, so this is the reason <coughs> the theta function appears, appears here. And therefore, this, this integral is actually the integral from minus infinity, not to plus infinity, but only to t, right? So g of t minus t prime. This is theta function that takes care of this. F of t prime dt prime. Right? So if you want, if you want, this is a this is a causality. Causality showing implicitly in the Green's function. And I uh, uh, I want you to notice that that there are two words here, so analyticity related in uh, Fourier space. And causality, uh, these things are related. It's not an accident. So this is a rather generic situation. So fine. So this is a retarded Green's function. So is it useful? So this example, of course, is uh, um, very simple. But um, uh, we want to do a similar thing, essentially, in quantum field theory. Right? So in quantum field theory, the situation is very similar in the sense that we do have some Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, so let me let me maybe erase this board here. So suppose we have a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian, and uh, uh, of of a certain system, and we act by an operator. So let's say in quantum mechanics or quantum field theory. So what do we have? We have a system which is described, let's say, by Hamiltonian H0. And then I want to act by some perturbation. Let's call it delta H, which may be time dependent. I want to act on my system. And this perturbation can have various forms. But <coughs> let me write this in the following way. So this is the integral over d free x with some source, maybe actually several sources, but and some operator t and x. Right. So it, it, it's not from this expression. It's not perhaps very transparent what is what is going on. But let me let me comment on that. So what what we want to do actually? So suppose you want to study transport in your system. So you have some system, maybe neutral, say, right? 
which is in thermal equilibrium. There are no fluxes, nothing, everything is dead, right? So it's thermal equilibrium, right? So but you want to compute a transport coefficient, for example, for a current uh, which flows in this system. So you need some ways to generate this current in order to do the measurement. How you generate the current? Well, you act by some external field, right? So uh, suppose you apply some external field, and then external field will disturb the system. So of course you don't want to disturb the system in such a way that you completely destroy it, right? So better your perturbation delta H will be sufficiently small. So you just slightly perturb the system out of equilibrium so that, for example, the distribution of charge in the system becomes slightly inhomogeneous and therefore the current will flow from high concentration of charge to low concentration of charge. If this happens, then if, again, if this external influence is sufficiently small, you would, ex you would expect, just like we had this in this simple example, that the response of the system will be linearly proportional to the disturbance. Right? Of course, if you want, you can compu uh, compute also nonlinear response. This is possible. It's not that, uh, extremely difficult. But, but the first order, right, in this, in this small signal, external influence, you will, have a, you will have a flow of current, and this flow of current will be proportional to the external field, which, which forces the system to produce this current. Right? And the coefficient of proportionality will be one of the transport coefficients, uh, for example, conductivity. So this is, this is the strategy of what, what we want to do. Now, the second example is perhaps uh, less obvious, uh, but nonetheless, it's quite, uh, 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 it's quite important. Suppose you want to measure viscosity of the system in a similar way. Right? Viscosity is a measure of internal friction between layers of liquid. So when you have a shear viscosity, it means that you have some, so some layers of, of liquid and gas uh, which, uh, which sort of they, uh, they move locally with different velocities and, and there is some internal, internal friction, just like friction between your pumps, for example, right? So because particles of one layer can penetrate particles of other layer and this creates friction, right? So how can you, so you have a system in thermal equilibrium. How can you create a shear, right, a shear strain in your system by some external influence. You cannot apply electromagnetic field because it doesn't couple to uh, neutral particles, right? So you need something which couples to uh, matter, to energy or, or mass of your system, which may be uh, a neutral system. We do have external agent which is perfectly suitable for doing this. It's gravity, right? It's gravitational wave. So instead of external electromagnetic wave, you use gravitational wave. And gravity couples to any matter and any, any mass and any energy. So you send, instead of electromagnetic wave, you send a gravitational wave of the appropriately chosen polarization. And this gravitational wave will create a shear. And therefore, according to the, the same kind of philosophy, you, you are able to measure a coefficient of proportionality, which will be shear viscosity. All right? So this is the, this is the goal. Right? So now we will put this in formulas, but, but I want you to reflect on this for a second, right? So, so we have some external perturbation uh, by some operators, and these operators could be, for example, uh, the, uh, 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 for example, the uh, gravitational field, the external gravitational field, and the gravitational field, H mu, will couple to energy momentum tensor. So your operator in question will be T mu, and therefore you can do this, you can do this computation. So let's do this. So, <coughs> Uh, we all know, so from quantum mechanics, and the calculation in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory is actually very similar. So I will just appeal to your standard knowledge of time-dependent perturbation in, in quantum mechanics and in, 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 in perturbation theory. If you have, if you have a, a, a theory with Hamiltonian H0, and then you act with a small perturbation uh, delta HT, then you can compute what happens to the expectation value of O, and let me, let me do, I will write the formula. So, so the change in the expectation value of some operator O of T and X is um, given by the integral over dt prime d3 X prime G retarded, the Green's function, retarded Green's function of T minus T prime X minus x prime lambda b, summation over b of t prime x prime. 
Okay, so this is this is the main uh, formula that we have. Where um, uh, so delta. So when I write down delta um, delta O, delta O, what I have in mind is the expectation value of O in the system which has H naught plus delta H, right? In in this system, right? In this system, minus the expectation value of O in the unperturbed system. The definition and the retarded Green's function. of t minus t prime x minus x prime is proportional to heavy side theta function, as we saw in this simple example. And then there is this interesting object. It's the expectation value of the anti-commutator of operators at t, t and x. And um, um, t prime and x prime. So this is anti-commutator computed with a Hamiltonian H naught in unperturbed system, for example, in thermal equilibrium. All right. Now, in Fourier space, erase this harmonic oscillator. Now, in Fourier space, Uh, the same formulas look extremely familiar to this simple case of harmonic oscillator. Namely, this is minus G retarded AB of omega and Q. And then there is a there is a source. Okay, so this is our tool number two the main tool to compute transport. And we will see in a second how this goes. So for example, so EG, the examples which I mentioned are the following. So if O is the operator of current, for example, you have U1 current in your system, uh, <coughs> or for example, it could be energy momentum tensor of your system, T menu. So uh, note that these are conserved currents, right. both of them, conserved currents. Then uh, the role of lambda is played either by electromagnetic field or the gravitational wave, gravitational field, h minu. All right. And uh, so <coughs> I will not. So you may ask, well, okay, this appeared out of the blue, more or less, right? I didn't derive this formula. I did derive a simple harmonic oscillator uh, formula because that was very easy to do. On board. This is relatively easy to do as well, but it will take some time. And it's written essentially in any textbook on quantum mechanics. So I will leave it for you as an exercise. It's, it's, a, it's, a, fairly, it's a fairly straightforward exercise, but you, you have to. So if you have difficulties, and please, I mean, if you're interested in this subject, please do prove this from, from that, right? So that, 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 that's a calculation for one page or less. And if you have difficulties, then you can look at various books in my reference list. So for example, in the book of um, uh, Le Bilac, uh, there is this uh, nice derivation of this, of this expression. Uh, also, um, uh, there is a second edition of uh, the book by Elias Kiritsis on string theory. It's called String Theory in, Nut in Nutshell. Second edition, 2019. So Kiritsis. <coughs> Second edition, uh, and this is, I think, chapter 15. Chapter 15, and also the same d discussion, a similar discussion appears in a fantastic set of lectures on hydrodynamics and holography by Pavel Kofton. Highly recommended for various purposes. You can download it from the archive. Okay, so I won't, I won't do the proof, but, but it's it's fairly straightforward. So again, 
all I need now to do to compute, for example, shear viscosity of a system X is the following. I need to choose a specific polarization. Right? I need to look at this linear response formula. And I need to compute the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And as we will see in five minutes, coefficient of viscosity enters the expression on the left-hand side. And if you happen to know by some means the expression on the right-hand side, maybe by perturbation theory, maybe by some other means, then you can just, you can just read off the answer. Right, so this is the this is a tool. It's it's very generic, so it, it works for many many calculations of, of, of transport. All right. Any questions about the, the tool and the formulas and board? As in the remaining ten to fifteen minutes I will I will talk about how precisely how to proceed. Okay. Or at least we can start this computation and finish it tomorrow. <coughs> okay. So let me call this transport in QFT. from first principles. And um, when we start talking about transport, we have to talk about hydrodynamics, about fluid dynamics in general. So what is fluid dynamics? So uh, fluid dynamics, we consider fluid dynamics as an effective theory. So let me write this down. So hydrodynamics. Effective theory and sufficiently large distances and large times. Now, um, what does it mean exactly, right? So, we already discussed this miraculous process by which a generic system of n constituents with time flowing to plus infinity, most of the system will go to an equilibrium state which is characterized by very few parameters, except uh, apart from Avogadro number of parameters. But it is also true that a system of this type can be slightly disturbed from equilibrium. You can think of water in complete equilibrium, right? And then I can shake it, I can I can produce some, some waves and so on and so forth. And the description of these waves, maybe even turbulent waves, will not require Avogadro number of equations of motion. It will require Navier-Stokes equations. So somehow, we know that there is a regime in the generic system of n constituents that will be described not only by just collection of conserved charges in full thermal equilibrium, but even if you step away slightly from this equilibrium, it will require just few quantities to describe it. And this regime is a hydrodynamic regime. So the question is, can you prove it? Just like with uh, uh, thermal equilibrium, right? So can you use mathematical theorems about ergodicity and so on and so forth to prove that such regime actually exists, mathematically, strictly speaking, right? And this is, generically, this problem is not solved. So if somebody comes with you with his or her favorite Hamiltonian and asks, can you actually guarantee that this particular microscopic system will have a hydrodynamic regime? Uh, the answer will be, the honest answer will be, well, we actually don't know, but most probably yes, because this is what we observe around us in the universe. Right? There are mathematical ways to approach this, but again, so they're not entirely comprehensive. So there is a conjecture here, hidden sometimes, right, that, that, that this effective theory actually exists. But <coughs> nonetheless, so assuming this conjecture, we know that if a system is in equilibrium, it's characterized by uh, values of uh, conserved charges, 
for example, in microcanonical ensemble, it will be a total energy, which is a constant throughout the system, and total charge, which is a constant throughout the system. And if I want to describe this regime, which is a near equilibrium regime, then what I do, I introduce quantities such as the density of these charges. So this is my E divided by the free volume. And the density of this charge, let me denote it by Q, X, which is the charge now depending on, on, on T and X, divided by the free uh, uh, volume. So these are densities of conserved charges. of conserved <coughs> charges. And um, uh, more precisely, right, so, so more precisely, more precisely, uh, when we talk about, for example, Lagrangian such as QCD, what we mean by, 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 by these object is the following. So I take the uh, <coughs> energy momentum tensor operator of my quantum field theory, and I compute the expectation value with a density matrix, which is time dependent and non-trivial, not equilibrium. So in general, it could be extremely complicated quantum state. But I know the way, in principle at least, how to compute expectation value. And expectation value will be denoted simply from now on. It will be denoted by t mu nu without a hat. But <coughs> this thing will depend on t and x in general. OK, so this is just notation, but we need to understand that that in principle, there is a well-defined procedure of how to get this function. All right. So in particular, in equilibrium, in equilibrium, so, In equilibrium, uh, you have T mu nu, right, the expectation value computed at temperature and some chemical potential via trace of the equilibrium value of our density matrix times the rate of T mu nu. And we actually know what, uh, so we will denote this by, again, by according to this notation, by T mu nu equilibrium. And we know what this thing is, is given by in a system which is isotropic, homogeneous isotropic, is given by a 4 by 4 matrix, where on the diagonal you have T0,0 component, which is the energy density of the system. And uh, in equilibrium, of course, this is constant. Right? So this is, this is constant. Right? So, so, so the epsilon equilibrium right, is this total E over free volume, which is a constant. Right? So this is a equilibrium values, let me put like this, and pressure. I will later remove this equilibrium label, but right now I won't comment on on uh, the origins of this particular uh, metric. So if you forgot where this form is coming from, then Landau Lifshitz volume two. Right. So this is Pascal's law. Right. So. Let me not say more, right? And energy density, so written in a covariant form. Right? Want to read it in a covariant form. So, <coughs> so this is the equilibrium state of, uh, of your system, which is characterized, again, by the densities of concert uh, charges. Now, so this is for, for homogeneous isotropic system in its rest frame. Rest frame. Now, uh, if you want, so uh, if you want to covariant expression, so this is this is in the rest frame of a fluid, the covariant expression for T menu covariant expression for T menu. So suppose now uh, your uh, fluid. Right, so this is a fluid, so in my rest frame. Now, suppose this fluid is moving with constant velocity, u mu, for a velocity u mu, relative to me. Right, so u mu is gamma c, comma gamma v, with obvious gamma 
is one of the square root. So then the covariant expression for T mu nu is also well known, and let me write it like this. So T mu nu equilibrium consists of two pieces. One of them is parallel to velocity, so to speak, and the second one is perpendicular, and this is the equilibrium u mu u nu. So again, so this is constant. This is important. <coughs> plus uh, plus pressure, equilibrium pressure, times the falling object delta mu nu, where delta mu nu by construction is the Minkowski tensor eta mu nu plus u mu u nu. So uh, I will be using the conventions for metric. The Minkowski tensor will be diagonal minus uh, plus plus plus. All right. So we have this. Now <coughs> the property of this delta. Why introduce delta? It has a very nice property that u mu delta mu nu is equal to zero. So this delta acts as a projector. Now what happened here? What happened here is that I rewrote uh, this expression. So exercise for you, uh, a simple exercise for you is to derive this line from the uh, expression for t mu nu in, in, its, uh, in its rest frame. Right? So this can be done in two ways. Uh, one of them is rather obvious. We have a tensor of second rank. And we want to switch to a reference frame, which is moving relative to the rest frame of a fluid, uh, of uh, our frame, with a constant velocity u mu. So there is a tensor, so we do Lorentz transformation, and we arrive at the expression in the frame, which is now moving with constant velocity. This is uh, uh, approach number one. Do it once in your life, and enough. And the second one is to say that in this situation, we only have covariant objects in questions, u mu itself, and uh, the metric uh, tensor eta mu nu, and we have a system with symmetric indices mu nu, and the only expression which we can write down, uh, built out of these two components, is something, some coefficient times u mu u nu, plus some coefficient times uh, eta mu nu, with some unknown coefficients. And then you go to the rest frame, so by once you write this down, you go to a rest frame of the fluid, which is characterized by u mu equal to 1, 0, and you require that your coefficient match the coefficient in the rest frame of the fluid, and then you find, you find this expression. All right? So it's, it's simple, but if you haven't done this once in your life, please do it uh, now, today. Now, <coughs> the last thing I want to say is, is the following. So here we are dealing, so this is just, this is just expression, a covariant expression um, uh, uh, for, um, uh, for a system which um, is in thermal equilibrium. Nothing, uh, everything is constant, so everything is completely constant. Right? Just written in a peculiar way, which will be useful for the future. So I introduced this projector, but this will be useful. So any object, any vector, just like any vector, you can decompose into piece which is parallel to some velocity and then perpendicular to it. You can do the same with the tensor, right? So this is what we have done, right? So this thing is parallel, this thing is perpendicular to this u mu in the following sense, all right? Now, what I would like to do next is the following. In near equilibrium, my conjecture is that the system will not be described immediately by the Avogadro number of equations of motion. It will be described by very few equations of motion because in equilibrium it is described by very few quanti constant quantities. So what I will do, I will promote these quantities such as the energy density, T naught naught, right, and uh, also velocities, the relevant velocities, T naught i, which is zero in equilibrium, I will promote them not to constant, but to functions of time and x, under the assumptions that these will be sufficient to slow varying functions with respect to the motion on the scales of the molecular microscopic scale of the system. Right? So this function will take a long, long time 
to change in comparison to, for example, interaction between molecules in a gas. So this is internal time scale involved, like mean free time. So it is a conjecture, of course, that uh, this description will be adequate, and we will see where, in principle, it breaks down explicitly. Right? In some cases, like in kinetic theory, when you have additional tool at your disposal, you can actually point out why and where it breaks down. In some cases, it's very difficult to do, so you, 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 you resort to this kind of hand-waving and, and conjecture things. But the construction itself will be completely mathematically robust. So one last remark is the following. Uh, once you introduce u mu, right, so see what, what happens here. So this, uh, this system of equations is written with respect to this u mu, right, and u mu uh, in some sense specifies uh, the, the, uh, the reference frame in which, in which a system is, uh, is, is at rest, right? So u mu equal to 1, comma, uh, 0 is the rest frame of the system. So this is a reflection of the fact that when, whenever you talk about finite temperature, finite chemical potential system, you actually break Lorentz symmetry of your system, right? You introduce a preferred system where temperature is equal to T. Everywhere else, uh, it's equal to T times something, right? So, that, that's, so you, have, you, you have broken Lorentz invariance, but you still can write down expressions in a covariant way. Right, and this is exactly what is happening here. Right, so you, you break Lorentz invariance uh, because you have a chosen, you have a chosen vector u mu. Right, it's chosen. Right, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a velocity of your of your fluid, uh, but nonetheless you can still write all these expressions in the covariant form. Nothing prevents you from doing this. All right. So what we are going to do next is to write down equations by using this philosophy of effective theory. We will write down the subsequent uh, um, term in the expression for t mu nu, but now not in equilibrium, but in a state which is sufficiently close, but not equal to equilibrium state. So in other words, our u mu here is a constant, right? It moves to constant velocity. But let's promote our u mu to something which slowly varies with x and t. Then, of course, there will be many, many more terms in these expressions which are compatible with symmetries of our t mu nu. Right? We can write down gradients of this u mu, d mu, u nu, and so on and so forth. In fact, infinitely many of such gradients. So there will be a huge tail here, infinite tail. And combining this tail, which is known as constitutive relation, with conservation law of t mu nu in the form d mu t mu nu, equal to zero, we will obtain equations of higher dynamics. Depending on how many derivatives you will have in this tail, you will get Euler equation. The next order, you will get Navier-Stokes. The next order, you get Barnett equations. And then the next order, nobody named equations. So if you want, you can write them down. They will be named after you. <laughs> so this is free. For OK, but let's do it tomorrow. Questions? I have a question. Yeah. When you wrote down the range function for a perturbation in the Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. so you wrote uh, the variation of the expectation value of a given operator. Yeah. Uh, if I move now in quantum field theory, can we ensure that the right part is going to preserve causality? So it's not going to have support outside the. Yes, so it will, yes, precise, so this, this is, the procedure of deriving this formula is precisely such that, that the causality will be preserved. And it, kind of philosophically speaking, it's no different from what we did with, with dumped harmonic oscillator. Now, of course, when you have a, partic a given theory, right, so, so generically, so you, you derive it and you, you, you think of causality and so on, but if you're given theory and you don't know the properties of the theory, and then you calculate Green's function, and you discover that for some values of parameters in your theory, this function suddenly, the retarded Green's function, suddenly uh, uh, you, you have the singularities of this function, such as poles, moving into the upper half plane, right, for some values of parameters. Then, of course, this means that, that things are bad, right? It means that it, it would violate causality. It means that something, 
in your system. So your system is telling you that for these values of parameters, something is happening there, and your approximation becomes invalid, right? So maybe, maybe, maybe the whole Hamiltonian should be thrown away, right? Or perhaps uh, there is a phase transition, or there is, some, there is something where your, your simple description, this linear response and so on, it breaks down, right? So, so of course you have to, a priori it's not guaranteed that when you calculate with G-retard that in a given, with a given Hamiltonian, that the structure will be as, as expected, right? So it depends on, on, on the theory in question. But it must be, for causality, the, the singularities must lie in the lower half plane. Other questions? Yes, please. So your statement is that hydrodynamics are an effective, like classical hydrodynamics, are an effective theory describing QFT in a certain mode. Yes. So, on the to yeah. what about the so-called uh, fluid gravity correspondence? Would yeah. Be related somehow. Y yes, it is related, and moreover, it is related directly. So, since you since you brought this up, so allow me. Okay, two minutes, right? I'll try to be very brief. I, I know people are tired and so on. But this is a very important question. Um, so effective theory in general, um, the, the concept, philosophical concept is the following, right? So again, so suppose, suppose you think about, about water, right? We know microscopic theory of water, H2O and so on. There are molecules and we can write down Hamiltonian and so on and so forth. We don't care about this microscopic degrees of freedom if we just want to describe wave in, our, in, in a glass, mm -hmm. right? So it's sufficient to write down the yes stokes equation, so even less to describe this, right? But microscopically, there should be a way to derive the yes stokes equations from a given Hamiltonian, from H to O, right? From the micro microscopic structure. Mm -hmm. Now, in modern sort of uh, philosophical um, view of quantum field theories, right? So this is done through the mechanism of building effective effective theories, right? Not necessarily effective field theories, but if you happen to, if you know how to write Lagrangian, then it will be effective field theory, right? So you, you go from microscopic description by integrating out the fast degrees of freedom, right? So the uh, generic system, even mechanical system, right, would have a so-called fast degrees of freedom and slow degrees of freedom. So you can, you can, you can remove, you can integrate over the, over the fast degrees of freedom and arrive to a certain expression, some effective Hamiltonian or effective Lagrangian description, which will be valid at times and scales sufficiently larger than this fast motion. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is precisely what is happening when you, when you derive, so to speak, hydrodynamics uh, from the microscopic theory, except that in full generality nobody was able to do it. Right? We, we assume that the same process should work, but it's very difficult to, to, to actually to show. Now, and, and this is, but, but we know how to build effective theories even without knowing how precisely to integrate out things, right? We know that effective theory is built by, basically, you, you consider all operators which are compatible with symmetries, right? And then you, 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 build, you build expansion in some of the parameters which reflects this fact that you go from fast degrees of freedom to, to slow degrees of freedom, right? Mm -hmm. This is exactly what we are going to do with hydro tomorrow, right, in, in, on, on, this, on this level, right, in derived and stocks and so on. But, but your question, so, so but, but then, then there is a question, can you, actually, can you actually relate this to a certain, so if you have a tool such as holography, which relate certain systems, description, in particular hydro description, to a dual description in terms of gravity, can you relate equations such as Navier Stokes equations to the uh, equations of the dual gravity? And the answer is yes. And this correspondence is one to one. So in some sense, when you think about gravity in general, so what do, what do we know about gravity? We have, we have Einstein's general relativity, which is an effective description of gravitational uh, interaction at uh, 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 scales which are much, much larger than a Planck scale. We have absolutely no idea what is happening with gravity at Planck scale, right? There's some quantum gravity, string theory, God knows what. We don't know. But we know that if we go to sufficiently large scales, the equations will be Einstein's equations and the action will be Einstein's Hilbert action. This is exactly the same as happens with hydro, right? So uh, we can write down Hamiltonian for hydro in this case, right? But we don't know how to get from this Hamiltonian to Navier-Stokes equations. But in philosophy, it's the same. It's the same. Right? So when, when you have a holography, and we will discuss it tomorrow and, 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 uh, and uh, on Thursday, uh, when you have a holography, 
these steps sometimes for some models can be traced on both sides, right? And the uh, sort of averaging over these five degrees of freedom, which is happening in deriving Navier Stokes, is mapped into averaging over these degrees of freedom in, in quantum gravity, which we don't know. But we arrive into the, uh, to the, to the, to the system of equations, which are Einstein's equations. All right? So I, uh, the, the, the bottom line is that Einstein's equations of a dual description can be in fluid gravity duality related to Navier Stokes in your, in, your, in your effective description of quantum field theory. And this is not an accident. This is just a, because both theories are effective theories. Okay? In fact, there have been proposals of the so-called uh, uh, um, uh, analog of a uh, combination between analog gravity and the DSCFT. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So um, Construct the gravitational system with analog gravity, and then we put to a CFT dual. Y yes. So we get a duality between two QFT systems. Yes. Uh, I propose we, we discuss this particular uh, topic uh, in, in, in private, maybe over dinner, because it's sufficiently specialized to, to, to bring to the audience. Okay, now, now food. Right, so. <laughs>